everyone. My name is Ala Reeves. I am part of the professional development team here at McGraw-Hill Education. Today we're presenting the fourth webinar in our seven-part series on the subject of the NGSS and its impact on K-5 science instruction. We'll begin our presentation on the missing core idea in just a couple of minutes. But before I do, I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping issues. First of all, during the webinar, you will be in listen-only mode. We will take a few minutes to answer questions. So if you have them, please type them into the questions box, and we'll answer as many as we can. If we run out of time and can't answer all your questions, we'll be happy to follow up with you via email. Also, before we start, we'd like to get to know something about you. So we'd like to ask you a couple of poll questions. Yeah, polls are not launching for some reason. Well, we have 75% voted. There we go. Yeah, but I'm not seeing the results. Well, we have 78% teachers, 11% principals, 11% um, district curriculum administrators. Great. Thanks, Gary. All right, next question, please. We'll let Gary um, speak to these if he can see them. So the poll is posted. And 85% of the people have voted. And the results are um, pretty well distributed. Not as many from the Northeast, only 18%, but exactly 27% from the other three regions, Southeast, Midwest, and cool. Southwest West. Great. And then I think our last question is coming up. at grade levels. We get our last question posted. Actually, that's the uh, last question. You guys. Can oh, that was the last question. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, then we all are all set. Thank you, everyone, for voting. And now, please let me introduce our presenter. Dr. Carrie Snyder is lead writer for the NGSS as well as a research professor at Portland State University. Gary, we're all yours. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Um, I'm happy to talk about what is probably my favorite topic on the Next Generation Science Standards, well, probably second to engineering. And that's the missing core idea. And before we start, I want to introduce my assistant today. Um, this is Gibson, who will keep me company. And um, he really likes to, to help out in, in the office. Uh, so you might see him wandering by the screen. I didn't want to scare anybody. So let's get started. Um, there we go. Uh, let's have our first slide, Allah. And this is where you find out what the missing core idea is. So the framework presented 13 core ideas. But when that was translated to the Next Generation Science Standard, it turns out that there were just 12 core ideas. So the question is, what is the missing core idea, and where is it hiding? And uh, for an illustration, we have this, I think it's a seahorse, hiding in, a, um, uh, in some seaweed. Uh, so take it just a second and make sure you can see that. Uh, it's hiding in plain sight. And that's really kind of the message today about this particular core idea. And we'll see the next slide, and we'll see what the core idea is that I've been talking about. And it is. Links among engineering, technology, science, and society. Now, 
those of you who have been in uh, the field of, of science education for many years probably know the name Robert Yeager. Starting in the 1980s, um, Dr. Yeager published, presented at NSTA meetings uh, in just about any form he could find about the importance of what he called science, technology, and society. Uh, the idea that what's really important is that kids really need to connect what they're learning in school with, with the world around them. And that connection is usually through technology. So the way science affects people is largely through the technologies that we experience. Uh, and a, a big part of that is for people to be um, socially aware and recognize their responsibility as citizens. So it's not simply we need to know about science and technology for ourselves, but as citizens we need to make intelligent decisions. And this idea has gained um, currency over the years and is, is, it was a very important part of the next generation science standards. So the question is why is it missing? Um, and the answer is that it's not really missing, it's missing as a core idea but it appears in the next generation science standards as a cross-cutting concept. And to explain why that's the case, let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, so in the framework, each of the 13 core ideas was accompanied by a question. Um, and we're, we're calling these essential questions. So they're really fundamental questions that we want kids to be able to answer when they leave. 12th grade. So how are engineering, technology, science, and society interrelated? And there are two answers given to this. So in a sense, it's a rhetorical question because the framework actually gives you an answer. In this case, it gives you two answers. And these are the answers that we want kids to understand when they leave. And understand not just be able to repeat back, but understand at a deep level. So let's take a look at the next slide. And we'll see what the first answer is. So the fields of science and engineering are mutual supportive. Science supports engineering, and engineering supports science. And in the middle is technology. So let's, let's take a look at the rest of that paragraph and see what it says. Go ahead, Ella. So advances in science offer new capabilities, materials, and new understandings of processes that can be applied through engineering to produce advances in technology. So there are millions of examples of this. Um, rocketry, for example, um, uh, understanding combustion, uh, led to rocketry, uh, led to all sorts of propulsion, led to aircraft that we have. So aircraft change people's lives, perhaps more so than rocketry although we all enjoy fireworks display. But, um, uh, but the way we experience as a society, the fact that we can travel all around the planet. I don't know about you, but I'm visiting friends in San Francisco coming up at uh, Thanksgiving, and we're just going to get on an, an airplane and go. We would not have been able to do that 50 years ago. So uh, these advances in science have enabled advances in, in, um, in flight, which are changing society. So let's take a look at the next part of this paragraph. And then advances in technology provide scientists with new capabilities. Uh, capabilities to record, manage, analyze data, model complex systems. Those are computers, of course. Um, and instruments for observing things like, I mean, where would science be if it weren't for microscopes and telescopes? So those ideas are pretty obvious. Um, we wouldn't have um, the technologies we have today if it weren't for science, and we wouldn't have the science if it weren't for the technologies. But this goes on a bit. So we have another, um, what's our next slide, Ala? So in addition, engineers' efforts to develop or improve technologies often raise new questions for scientists. This is kind of a new idea that's not very commonly been taught. So for example, uh, historically, um, in many cases, you get a technology that's developed and disseminated to people before scientists understand how it works. 
also the most famous um, example of this is the steam engine. The steam engine led to questions. Well, how do we improve the steam engine? Well, to know that, you need to know how it works to begin with. And that led to the entire development of the science of thermodynamics. An entire field of science developed to understand the steam engine so we could improve it. And of course, improvements led to further questions and further refinement of that whole theory. A more recent example is one that, to me, seemed like magic. I was a teacher at the time, a uh, rather young teacher. And it was uh, the invention of uh, superconductivity. And uh, I remember, before then, it was kind of a uh, expectation. You, there's no free lunch. And therefore, all materials have some electrical resistance. Well, here is a case where you could remove all electrical resistance. Initially, these were uh, very, very low temperature superconductors. Uh, that would happen at you know close to absolute zero. But then high temperature superconductors came out that would work at temperatures of liquid nitrogen. Still cold, but nonetheless something that is um, uh, could be accomplished. Um, and the the problem, and, and in fact, you might remember some demonstrations of this. Um, it is. Um, they used a superconductor and a magnet, and then on top of it, a magnet would be suspended. Uh, it would seem to be hovering in middle in, in midair. So the idea that you could create something that was no electrical resistance that would be suspended in the air seemed like magic at the time. It was so magical that scientists couldn't explain it, and that forced the scientists to come up with a theory of high temperature superconductors that led to a Nobel Prize. So, um, so there are many cases where there's an invention. The technology precedes the science, driving the science to, uh, to try to understand what's going on. So let's look at the next slide. There we go. OK, so now we're starting to think about, OK, what does this look like in the classroom? And um, each of the standards in the Next Generation Science Standards has three boxes below it. Uh, on the far right hand, the far left hand box, it's about the practices related to the performance expectations above. In the middle box, there are core ideas. And in the right hand box, there are cross cutting concepts. And these were all laid out in the framework. And they included such ideas as um, systems and systems models, patterns, uh, cause and effect. These ideas that cut across all sciences. Well, uh, when the um, uh, science, engineering, and technology and society in the natural world became a cross-cutting concept. It was added to that right-hand column. And uh, what I've pulled for you are some examples from, from first grade through fifth grade of some specific performance expectations where it's called out that this is a really nice example to show uh, this, this interdependence of science and engineering. So here's a first grade one. Um, in order to show their understanding of this, of this um, standard, students should be able to plan and conduct investigations to provide evidence that vibrating materials can make sound, and that sound can make materials vibrate. So the idea is to, for kids to experience various types of things that vibrate, obviously, and make sound. Now, one of them is right here. And of course, you're going to want to have kids put their hands on their throat and feel that vibration as they talk. Uh, but then to look at other things like musical instruments, stringed instruments in particular. Uh, here is a, um, a tuning fork. And it's great if you have one, but you can communicate this idea with anything that vibrates. A drum is another good example. So um, the idea is that whatever you're trying to produce, if you know the science of it, you can do a better job of it. So for example, the science of musical instruments really helps us produce better musical instruments. Um, of course, something like the Stradivarius violin was, was developed hundreds of years ago, where the science of acoustics was not nearly as developed as it is today. But if we think of science very broadly as understanding the natural world and how it functions, the Stradivari who, who invented the Stradivarius understood wood and understood uh, how to, um, he had some, uh, some understanding of a theory that helped him develop that violin. 
So again, it may not be modern science, but understanding the world is science itself. So also technology in influences science, and this is the case of a doctor uh, using a stethoscope. Um, what I was actually hoping we'd find is a picture of someone using uh, sound recording uh, devices to study the, the, the sounds the birds make, the different bird calls. Scientists use, um, or another example I remember was an underwater study of dolphin sounds, trying to understand the way dolphins communicate. And to do that, you have to be able to record sound and analyze sound. Um, then there are cases, of course, forensic uses of, of instruments. So here's an example where science, is, science influences technology, and then technology influences science. Let's go on to the next example. And I think we have probably a, a third grade example coming up. Uh, yes. So this is another performance expectation that students should be able to define a, a simple design problem that can be solved by applying scientific ideas about magnets. So one of the problems is how do we find our way? By a design problem, we're simply talking about an engine, a problem involving some type of engineering design or some way of, of solving the problem, um, uh, defining and then solving a problem. So finding your way, for example, a very helpful instrument to do that is the compass. Of course, the compass alone doesn't tell you how to find your way. You need to know how to orient the compass, how to follow up uh, 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 instructions for using the compass and so forth. But this is a case where um, there are a lot of problems you can solve with the compass. But what's interesting is the compass was developed thousands of years ago in ancient China. And over the years, as people use the compass over larger and larger stretches of the of the Earth, in particular, ocean voyages. And over time, it became obvious that, um, that first of all, the compass did not needle, the north compass needle did not point to the geographic north of our planet, pointed somewhere off to the side. And then later it was found out that the, that the position of the north pole, of the north magnetic pole, was changing over time. So that led to a discovery that, um, uh, that Earth itself is a magnet. It's a, it's a huge magnet. And that led to trying to figure out, well, why is it a magnet, leading to understanding of the interior of the Earth. In a very simple sense, though, third graders can experience this by using the technology of magnetism to study the properties of materials, which, is, which will advance their scientific understanding of materials. So this girl, for example, is using a magnet to find out what types of materials are magnetic and which aren't. Often kids will guess that any metal is magnetic. They find out it isn't. Even a metal that looks like it's um, iron or steel, turns out uh, nickel, for example, um, or cer certain metals are not attracted. Certain alloys are not attracted by magnets. So, um, so again, this is an example of science influencing technology, technology influencing science. And we have one more example coming up. And Allah will show that one to you. I think it's a fifth grade example, if I remember right. And it's, again, about my favorite topic, astronomy. Um, so now here's an example on the left about science influencing, influencing technology. And the science of astronomy is, is very likely the oldest science. Uh, and the way people were able to develop sundials was uh, simply by observing how the sun uh, changed in the sky. Stick a, uh, a vertical stick in the ground. It's, an, it's a scientific instrument called a gnomon, just a vertical stick. And you can see how the shadow changes. If you use that stick alone, then you find out that, um, that the position of a shadow um, at, say, a, a 2 o'clock shadow um, may work for the next couple of days. It'll be around 2 o'clock. But a week from today, a month from today, the position of that shadow at 2 o'clock is different. So by experimenting with different sticks in the ground and, and so forth, um, people hundreds of years ago came up with this design. Notice that the stick in the ground is at, at an angle, at a slant. And it turns out that if you make that 
uh, centerpiece where the slant is equal to your latitude, it will give you the same shadow year-round. That shadow in that particular spot at 2 o'clock will always be there throughout the year. Now, in the beginning, it probably wasn't really understood why it worked so well. But then much later, it was understood that that, that angle is actually parallel to the, um, to the axis of the Earth, to the, to the geographic axis of the Earth. So um, if you think about it a little bit, it took me a while to think about it, to see how that worked, um, is that wherever the sun would pass over, it passed over making the same angle with that, um, with that slanted Milman. So that's how science influenced technology. The people had to really understand, observe over time, see the patterns over time, in order to develop the technology to tell time accurately that would, that would, be, that would work throughout the year long before uh, clocks were invented. And then, of course, technology influences science. And I was actually thinking it would be helpful simply to have a telescope there to show how the science of astronomy was advanced by technology. But, uh, but what we have here is the Hubble telescope, which uh, I immense, uh, made immense advances in, uh, in science. Without that technology, that included the technology of rockets to get that satellite up there the technology of optics uh, to figure out how to make a, uh, a mirror that is precise to a tiny fraction of a, of a hair's breadth, um, and, uh, um, and all the technologies of electronics that went into that, uh, into the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's another example. So I think uh, let's go on to the next slide where I have a question for you. So those of you who are out there sitting comfortably and listening to the story, hopefully you're thinking of some things that you teach where you're thinking, well, this would be a great example to show how science influences technology and technology influences science. So what I'd like you to do is use your question function and type in an example of your own. Um, identify the particular topic and then give us a sentence or two about how you would use that topic to teach the idea that science influences technology and technology influences science. So we're going to take a minute of science. I'll let you take a look at um, Gibson while we do that. Let's see if we can have some people type something in. So I'll, do we have anything typed in yet? Not yet. Be the first. OK, we have an answer. OK, let's hear it. All right, so Christopher says, the science is electromagnetic radiation. And the technology would be cell phone communications. Excellent. Um, while the rest of you are typing in something else, because uh, I hope we get to read another one, let me just say that um, part of the job of the writing team of the Next Generation Science Standards was to decide what are the most important core ideas to include. Now, we included just about everything that was in the framework, but not everything because we were told that there's just too much there. And one of the, um, I remember some discussion about, well, waves. You know, waves are kind of different. They aren't Newton's laws. Uh, they're kind of different from other things. And why are they important? And uh, the response was that, well, waves are absolutely essential in understanding communications. So telephone communication, cell phones, televisions, all sorts of communications have to do with waves. So we've got to include it. So the rationale for including the science in that case was technology and, and engineering using that technology. 
So that's a good example. It's an excellent example. Do we have another one? Yes, Wendy says science is Newton's third law and technology is airbags. Airbags. Okay, very good. Um, so I'm thinking of airbags as a way, um, so when you're driving a car and you get into an accident, the car hits something, you want to keep going because, well, want to keep going, that's an anthropomorphism, but the point is that because of Newton's first law, an object in motion wants to continue to remain in motion unless stopped by something else. Um, the airbag provides that stoppage and mu much more gently than with the dashboard of your car. So that's a really excellent example of understanding. And in fact, there, there have been so many experiments with, with crash dummies, even before the development of, of airbags. People had a really good understanding of the science, and, the, and someone developed the airbag technology. So that's a really good one. Now, what about uh, the technology influencing the science? One thing that um, occurs to me, do we have anything else on, on that, that that Wendy mentioned? No, that was it. Well, let me just mention that one of the problems that happen with airbags, and often with technologies, you know, you don't know the problems until they get out there. It's one of the unexpected side effects, is that uh, young children, or very petite people, very women in particular, uh, were starting to be injured by the airbags because the airbags were developed by engineers who happened to be six foot tall men. And um, uh, so that drove the science further. So what would an airbag look like that would, that would not harm a child? Or what further technological changes can we make, for example, to car seats uh, that would help to uh, eliminate that problem? So again, this is a wonderful example of you know, science influencing technology and vice versa. Is there one more? Nope, that's all we have right now. OK, so we're going to go on. We've been all been talking about the first answer to, to the question of how are science, engineering, technology related to uh, society and the environment. Let's move on to the next answer given in the framework, which is science, engineering, and technology influence society and the environment. So uh, together, these three, science, engineering, and technology, have had profound influ uh, effects on, on society. So consider, for example, agriculture. So 10,000 years ago, that was a major change when people didn't just gather roots and berries, but actually planted the roots and berries. Could, that changed their lives. They could stay in one place year round. Uh, transportation, health care, just about our lives are so different as a result of the technologies around us. In fact, you could argue that we live in a technological world, not a natural world. And even when we go out to the park, uh, we're surrounded by um, hybridized trees and a special kind of grass that was planted in that spot because uh, it functions very well for its purpose. So our lives are very different as a result of technology, which was influenced by science and engineering. Let's look at the next part of this statement. So each system can change significantly when new technologies are introduced. And it has both desired and unexpected outcomes. So for example, a change in, um, in transportation. Um, the bullet train. Uh, introduce the bullet train, and, um, uh, and people can get there much faster. So you might argue that. Uh, that that's been a, a change in the culture, especially in certain countries where they've been able to build a decent functioning uh, bullet train. But on the other hand, if there's an accident, uh, the results are, are perhaps more catastrophic because of the speeds involved. A cell phone is a perfect example of, here's a, just, here's a technology. I mean, I see in airports occasionally um, um, telephone booths. Telephone booths are hardly ever used anymore because we use cell phones now. And one of the unexpected side effects of telephones, of course, is further auto accidents. So um, nobody anticipated that. Uh, you do your best you can when you're an engineer to try to anticipate what the problems might be. But so just being aware of such uh, that there are going to be effects of changing
changes in technology is a really important thing for our kids and for adults to learn. Let's look at the next part of this. So not only does science and engineering affect society, but society's decisions, whether through market forces or politics, influence the work of engineers and scientists. So how do scientists and engineers uh, choose the problems they work on? Well, I will tell you, a lot has to do with where the money is. So what grants can you get? Um, you know, a scientist doesn't go out, uh, open a storefront, and sell science. Some has to fund that. And society as a whole really makes those decisions. Similarly with, um, with engineering. Now in this engineering, it's a little clear that market forces are important. So why, I was just looking at uh, consumer reports and see that there are all these different tablets. And there's kind of a, a range now halfway between, between computers and cell phones. There are all these tablets in between. They're sort of like computers, sort of like cell phones. There used to be just one of them, and now there are dozens of them. So why are engineers spending all this time designing them, and why are people building them? Because people want them. So they may not be thought of as conscious decisions of society as a whole, but what is society? Society is a collection of a lot of people. So that's how society makes the decisions. And in some cases, it's political forces that, uh, that makes a difference. Um, so policy decisions really matter. Uh, for example, let's take a look at the electric car. Uh, 20 years ago, the electric car died. I mean, one of the first, some of the first cars were electric. And for all these decades, we've had nothing but um, um, uh, cars that run with internal combustion engines that run on gasoline. For a while, we had a surge, and then they were gone. Now there is the political will for electric cars, so we're beginning to see them. So, um, so again, um, political market forces make a difference. Let's see the next slide, the last part of this sentence, last part of this paragraph, pardon me, that these decisions sometimes establish goals and priorities for improving or replacing technologies. And at other times, they set limits such as regulations, uh, extraction of raw materials, allowable levels of pollution, and so forth. So when we start talking about a carbon tax, or cap and trade system. These are systems to change technologies. And both science and engineering are involved here. So why would we want to do that? Well, it's really science that is making projections about what's going to happen if we continue burning uh, uh, fossil fuels at the same rates we're burning them, and trying to figure out what's going to happen as a result. What difference will that make to people who live in Key West, Florida, for example? Uh, versus, um, um, you know, living in, in higher latitudes. So science is really important here um, in, in understanding these changes. Engineers are the ones that are going to have to be actually making the changes and thinking about who is influenced. At this point, I just want to mention before we go on and look at the classroom, a colleague that I corresponded with for several years, he was a former dean of engineering at Gonzaga University. He was in his 80s when we were having our conversation. And he made the point that an engineer is a profession like doctors. There is the Hippocratic Oath, and engineers take something called a, um, uh, well, take, a, take an, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's engineer's credo, that's it. Engineers have the responsibility to society, not just to the person paying their salary. He believed that engineers shouldn't work for companies. They should be consultants. And they should be hired to tell someone who wants to build something whether or not it should be built, to make that um, ethical decision. Uh, it can also be a business decision, too. Uh, so that um, um, because engineering affects technology, technology affects society and the environment. Those are really big changes. Often, one person sitting in an armchair will make a decision that will end up affecting thousands or millions of people uh, and, and, uh, and natural habitat. So the engineer has a, a responsibility to play a special role there. So let's talk, pause for a moment, too, and look at these two ideas. Influence of engineering, not yet. <laughs> 
Okay, hold it there a minute. So the interdependence of science and engineering is a two-way street. Science affects engineering, engineering affects science. With the other question, the other answer to the question about science and engineering and technology on one side and society and the environment, that's also a two-way street. So you make discoveries in science and make decisions, technological decisions, telling engineers what to do. That affects society and the environment. On the other hand, society makes decisions that affect what engineers and technologies do. It's also a two-way street. So those are the basic ideas. And now let's see how this second idea plays out in the classroom. Go ahead. Now we're ready for the next slide. OK. So uh, here's another kindergarten example. Um, ask questions. We want students to ask questions to obtain information about the purposes of weather forecasting to prepare for and respond to severe weathers. Now, I'm not a kindergarten teacher. I'm not sure how to get kids to do this. But I do know that kids ask questions. And we want to encourage them to ask questions. So when studying the weather, get them to ask questions. And um, of course, as a teacher, I always want them to ask certain questions because they, they're very uh, productive. So one question is, well, why do we bother forecasting the weather? And again, this is something that kindergartners can probably answer. What if you turn on the radio and you find out it's raining that day? What are you going to do? Ah, I'm going to grab a piece of technology called a raincoat. And then I'm ready for school that day. So it's a matter of simply getting them to understand the idea about predicting the weather and what to do about it. Technologies are involved. Now, they, you may not wor use the word technology or engineering at the kindergarten level. But the ideas are what's important that we have ways that we can protect ourselves. Now, a raincoat is one way to protect ourselves against um, a, a rainstorm. But there are other ways of protecting ourselves against much more severe weather, such as what do we do if we hear that a tornado is coming? We go to the storm cellar. We go to the center of our school, where it's going to be safer. Um, so just the idea that we need to know how weather is going to happen will really help us. And understanding weather forecasting is a science. It's called the science of meteorology. And that leads to all sorts of, uh, of um, technologies. On the other hand, in the right-hand picture, what you can see is the technologies that were developed because society demanded it. We want to know and we want to understand the weather because it's, it's, it's essential. It's essential both to protect our safety and also just to protect our comfort and convenience and our business. So we need better instruments to do that. So this is a combination of a weather vane and an anemometer is what we're looking at in this picture here. And it looks like it's being used as just two instruments to study uh, an oncoming tornado. So over the years, there are all sorts of technologies that have been developed to advance the science of meteorology. Interestingly enough, one of the most important advances in meteorology was, you might think it's the thermometer. Or, um, uh, uh, or, or the instrument you're looking at here, the most important instrument was the telegraph. Because before then, in order, to inf in order to predict the weather, all you could see was what was around you. So you looked up in the sky and you'd see, ah, it's dark clouds. It's about to rain. It's a pretty short-term weather forecast. Uh, when the um, uh, uh, telegraph was first invented, it was possible to find out what the weather's like in the next county. And if you know the prevailing winds, which you could learn pretty quickly that way, and they said, you know, uh, if, if usually winds, well, in this country, the winds tend to move from the west to east. Storm systems move from west to east. So if you know that there's a storm system to the west of you, uh, you know pretty soon there's probably going to be a storm here. So technology has been terribly important in the advance of uh, and the science of meteorology. And then um, meteorology has been terribly important in the advance of all sorts of other technologies to, to address it. These are the ideas to engage kids with. And I'm going to leave it to the kindergarten teachers to figure out how to get them to ask questions. Um, and to, uh, I would guess, just encourage them to ask questions. But maybe some kindergarten teachers are out there who can uh, uh, give us some suggestions when we stop again for questions a little later. OK, let's look at the next slide. We're getting into what this means in the classroom. 
So I would guess we're going to come up with a second grade. Yeah, second grade. Uh, now these are the performance expectations from the NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards. And this one is to analyze data obtained from testing different materials to determine which materials have the properties that are best suited for an intended purpose. So um, what we have here are, um, um, so all of the different containers that we've developed have a profound influence, in this case, on the environment. Um, the, the cost of, um, uh, of um, landfills is just tremendous. It's skyrocketed as the human uh, population has skyrocketed. And um, uh, just go into you know, a, a beautiful park, and you see the results of it everywhere. Um, so, um, so that's a, an example of the influence of science and, uh, uh, and technology on the environment in this case. But then society uh, has, is pushing back. And uh, so there have been developments in recent years of technologies for containers that, um, that are much friendlier to the environment. So things that um, uh, uh, biodegradable packaging, for, for example, or um, peanuts for packing things that you can made out of starch, so you can just run water over them. They, deserve, they, they dissolve and go down the drain. Um, one of the um, most interesting examples that is about to be commercialized, I understand, is something uh, called edible food packaging. So the idea is that instead of taking that package and throwing it away, adding it to the landfill, the food comes packaged in something that you can eat. So thinking about, you know, just about, you know, nature, for example, think, think of a piece of fruit. An apple skin is a packaging for an apple that is edible. A banana has a packaging that is not edible, at least for people, but perhaps for other animals. So the idea is to think of some artificial ones that we can create that are edible. Think of some um, yogurt, for example, that's encased in some uh, strawberry or banana um, Material to add flavor to the uh, to the banana to the to the yogurt. So those are the ideas. But on the other hand, you can't just put them on the shelf because they're going to get dusty. So they need to be incorporated in some uh, biodegradable packaging. But think of what the world would be like if all of these packages that we use and throw away are all edible and biodegradable. How how that would improve. Um, save a lot of money for cities that pay a lot now for um, for trash pickup and landfills that could put that money into education. So here's ways in which, again, technology influences society environment and society influences technology and the work that scientists and engineers do. Let's go on to the next one, probably a fourth grade example. Uh, let's see if I remember that right. So um, this one is th that we want students to be able to obtain and combine information to describe that energy and fuels are derived from natural resources, and their uses affect the environment. Um, so you know we're extracting um, uh, crude oil from the bottom of uh, from the continental shelf. Um, that sometimes results in some negative things that were not anticipated, like um, oil spills, uh, some pretty serious ones in recent years. Uh, and that's what's used to fuel our cars. Uh, so that's an example where the uh, science of combustion and the science of geology, where to get these fuels, led to technologies such as this amazing um, drilling platform uh, and to cars combustion engines that, that use the fuels more and more efficiently, but still burn them. Um, and, uh, and that influences, impacts the environment, both the places where the uh, resources are extracted and also the atmosphere as a whole, leading to global climate change. So on the other hand, society is beginning to say, well, as the population grows, we can't, this is not sustainable. So to have um, a sustainable development, we need to start shifting the technologies we use. Now, I live in Portland, Oregon, which has probably more miles of bike lanes than just about any city. 
And the commute, I would say, is about 50-50 cars and bicycles. So society is gradually changing. Uh, there is a point also in the framework that it's not only society that makes the change, but it is the environment itself sometimes that constrains what engineers can do with technology. So for example, we're going to be reaching a point, we are reaching a point where fuel is more expensive. Why is it more expensive? Well, you can be um, cynical and come up with some reasons why it might be, but the truth is that as we get more and more out of the ground, it's more and more costly to extract. So the tar sands in Canada, for example, isn't just oil bubbling out of the ground, it's rocks. And it is expensive to cook those rocks so that we get fuel out of it. Uh, so, um, so it's the environment that is telling us that um, we have to start changing the ways we get uh, energy. Let's go on to the next slide. And what is the next one? Ah, OK. So again, here's a two-way street that what we do with science and engineering through technology affects society and environment, and the environment um, and society affect what scientists and engineers do. So I would like you to take just a moment. I'm going to give you a minute of silence to think of something you teach and to type it in um, where you think that this would be a really good opportunity for your students to get this idea, the second answer about influence of science and uh, of uh, technology and engineering on society, the environment, and the reverse. So clock is ticking. I'll let you say hi to our sleeping cat while you write. He is so peaceful right now, I'm not going to disturb him. So Allah, do we have anything written yet? We do not yet. OK, we're going to give a few more seconds here. Okay, I'm I'm um, I'm going to invite you to keep to, to write if you're if you're thinking of an idea. Do we have anything yet? Um, yes, we do now. Oh, okay, good. Yes. Go ahead. Amy says, um, advances in technology have produced disposable items that end in landfills. Ideas to recycle these items need to be created. Students have the imagination. Ah, very good, um, and. That's engineering, when you have an idea that, uh, or you have a problem that you've defined. You've got stuff in the, land, in the, in the uh, landfill. If we could just reuse it, if we're creative in reusing it, um, we, can, uh, um, we can prevent someone taking more natural resources. So we both, um, we do two things with it. One is we avoid using additional natural resources, and secondly, we avoid filling up our landfill so quickly. And that's a wonderful project because um, it really stimulates kids' creativity. And you can bring in some junk from home. And a great assignment is, OK, what could we do with this instead of putting in a landfill? We got another one? Yes, we do. Wendy says, technology is solar panels. and environment impact is less use of fossil fuels. Right. So that's a, a, a really, really good example. Um, and here is a case where, um, so technology through science uh, made, impacted the environment in major ways uh, through um, uh, the fossil fuel technology that we've used. And then, um, uh, then there was pressure from society to find other methods. Um, again, scientists came up with this. Uh, photoelectric effect, um, and um, uh, and the 
theory behind solar cells. Engineers got into the act and are still in the act trying to wring another percentage or two of, of efficiency out of it and reduce the cost so that eventually we really have a situation where, um, where we can start to produce more and more um, uh, solar cells. There's another interesting piece, too, that I often forget. We think about you know, engineering and technology leading to inventions, new ideas. But there's another part of it, and that's the business side, called entrepreneurial, uh, the, the entrepreneurial side, or entrepreneur, uh, uh, entrepreneurs who figure out how to take an idea and, and move it to the marketplace. And these are really important. Um, uh, these people play a really important part of the process. So for example, there's a company I read about in the New York Times today uh, that will put install um, uh, solar cells on a roof for no charge. Over the next 20 or 30 years, the homeowner continues to pay the same rate of the, um, of the electricity that they've been getting. And then the company recovers the difference between um, what those solar cells produce and what is produced on the grid. And they use that money to do other installations in other homes. So you don't have to have five or $10,000 to put solar cells on your roof if you, have a, uh, uh, if you want to reduce the uh, energy uh, footprint of your home. Um, uh, and here, this method will really allow solar cells to proliferate so that we, uh, again, can reach a point where we're using far less fossil fuels uh, so those really clever, innovative ideas about business are really equally as important as the inventions themselves. Is there another one? No, there's not. OK. Let's go on. I have a few final comments, and then we're going to have a few minutes for questions. So the next slide has uh, just a few last thoughts. So. Um, uh, so in order to understand both of these core ideas, students need to encounter them in different contexts. Each idea is a two-way street. And so the idea is to look for opportunities in your normal lessons that you teach. Now, um, uh, these, these cross-cutting concepts you'll find in that right-hand column uh, in the standards under clusters of, of performance expectations. Uh, and those are obvious cases where they really apply, such as the ones that I brought up today. But they apply in many other situations. In fact, almost any science lesson or an engineering lesson really has an opportunity to demonstrate these two ideas. So keeping in mind, though, that each one is a two-way street. And as kids get older, certainly at the high school level, I think it's really valuable for them to see how it goes both ways science influences technology and engineering, vice versa. Similarly, you have um, this interdependence. So um, the last thing I want to say is that those two ideas really embody what it means to be scientifically and technologically literate as a citizen. Because this is where science, technology, and engineering meet the real world. And what we really care about in the future is that we have a citizenry who understand that, understand that the decisions they make not only at the ballot box, but, but what they purchased when they go to Walmart really makes a difference. Uh, it makes a difference in society. It makes a difference on, uh, on their environment. So that's the end of my presentation. And do we have any questions? We're going to wait a couple minutes. I won't make up the cat. I'm glad he decided not to walk around off in that uh, to walk right in front of the screen better looking than I am, so that's OK. So um, Allah, as soon as we have a question, no question let's hear sir. it. Did I really answer everybody's questions today? It seems you did. OK. I, I like to wait at least 12 seconds, though. It's my wait time. <laughs> I double the amount of wait time that uh, Mary Bud Rose says is recommended. So let's give it just 
a few more seconds. No questions? Nope, none are written. Okay, well, I want to thank you, everybody. Um, I think you can see why this is my most um, uh, my most interesting topic. Uh, in my view, it's the most important one. I love astronomy. I love teaching science. I love engineering. But this is the one that I think is the most important as we think about what we want our kids to think about as they enter a world that is probably going to have a couple billion more people uh, than it has today. So thank you, and I hope you join me in the next webinar. Thank you, everyone.